Hello, my name is Claire Wachter. A year ago, I launched the Virtual Piano Pedagogue, a three-hour video series that explores the art of the phrase, the essence of Chopin, and the genius of Domenico Scarlatti. I am pleased to present a new series, the Virtual Piano Master Course. And in this topic, we will explore the power of Beethoven. It is my very special pleasure to introduce our guest artist for this video, Dean Kramer, who has had the honor of playing for legendary pianists such as Arthur Rubinstein in New York City's Alice Tully Hall and Gina Bachauer at Duke University. Interestingly, Dean Kramer is one of the few pianists in the world to have received lessons from the great Russian virtuoso Vladimir Horowitz. Among his many awards, Dean Kramer was the first prize winner in the first national Chopin competition and was a prize winner in the international Chopin competition in Poland. In this video series, Dean Kramer will challenge the standard opinions about the piano sonatas of Beethoven. I am sure that you will find Dean Kramer's insights into this great music a powerful experience. Beethoven's completely distinct identity as a composer in terms of formal structure, composition, pianism, technique, and piano sonority emerged with his first great solo piano music, the Opus 2 Sonatas, 1795. Almost all music historians and textbook works about Beethoven's music classify these Opus 2 Sonatas and other works from Beethoven's mid-twenties as examples of the early period of his conventionally labeled three style periods, that is, as part of a classical style that shares many elements with the piano sonatas of Mozart, Haydn, and Clementi. However, when we examine the Opus 2 sonatas closely, we find that these pieces are radically different from any other piano music composed up to that point in history by any composer. What exactly makes the music of Beethoven different from any other composer? What makes Beethoven sound like Beethoven? And what must we do to become great Beethoven players and interpreters? Let's go back to a critical time in the evolution of piano music, the years 1789 to 1795, to see if we can discover the secret to the power of Beethoven. In 1789, Mozart composed the Sonata in D major, K576, his last solo piano sonata. Here is the beginning of the beautiful slow movement. The ethereal and sublime sound of Mozart can be easily imagined as a symphonic movement or an opera aria. Now, here is the lovely second movement of one of Haydn's last sonatas, the Sonata in C major from 1794. The beautiful expansiveness of Haydn sounds almost like an improvisation. The beginnings of these two sonatas are so similar that if we transpose the Mozart into F major, the two pieces seem almost like twins.
very similar. In fact, the slow movement of Beethoven's Sonata Opus 2 No. 1, composed within a year or so of the Haydn, is also quite similar at the beginning. So here we have three pieces composed within a few years. It would be very easy to concede that the textbooks are indeed correct and that these three geniuses shared a classical language. But then Beethoven began to change everything. This magnificent music is the beginning of the slow movement of Beethoven's Sonata in A major, Opus 2, Number 2. The great Beethoven interpreter, Arthur Schnabel, often referred to this kind of music as processional, which I find a fascinating and powerful image. Notice the register. This music is set in the resonant deep middle of the piano. Beethoven was the first to explore the completely different sonority of the piano in this register. And many of his most moving and beautiful themes are in this heart range. For example, the famous slow movement of the Pathétique Sonata. And the second movement of the Appassionata Sonata. The slow movement of the Sonata Opus 2, Number 2, seems almost like a keyboard version of a string quartet. And as in a real string quartet, each part is equally important. In Beethoven, we must never exaggerate the importance of the first violin. The first violin part is marked tenuto sempre, and the cello part is marked staccato sempre. Beethoven asks the pianist to differentiate the long sustaining bow strokes of the melody from the pizzicato sounds of the bass. No major composer had ever used words to specifically indicate the differentiation as a performance direction. Beethoven's tempo and character marking is largo appassionato. There is no such marking in the keyboard music of any previous great composer. Beethoven had already begun to change the nature of piano music, the psychology of music making at the piano. The Appassionato reflects one of Beethoven's most radical and powerful innovations. What does it mean? I believe that we must play with a new kind of passionate intensity 
engaging our performance psychology to produce a much more intensely concentrated focus and depth. In the physical dimension, we must change our touch and our sound production, bringing our weight to the very bottom of the key. Without the power, concentration, and intensity, the music loses its strength, its heart, its greatness, its Beethoven. In the next setting of the first theme of this movement, we discover how Beethoven redefined the power of musical accentuation in order to create more emphatic and dynamic declamation, especially in his radical use of the sforzando accent singly or in sequence. The accent is like a very focused moment of intensity provided by sound, not necessarily by sheer force. We can think of the fullness or the sonority of the sound. The sforzandos build tremendous energy into the forward momentum and the progress of the phrase, heightening the musical tension of the agogic half notes. In our Beethoven playing, it is vitally important that we maintain the musical tension without interruption all the way through the phrase. The fortissimo at the climactic point of the phrase is the consummation of the phrase, like the open arm gesture of the conductor that calls forth the massive sound of the orchestral tutti. The fortissimo resolves immediately into the very personal and quiet music that ends the phrase and the first section of music. a perfect example of the tremendous sonic and emotional range of Beethoven's powerful new piano music. Later in the movement, we hear this passage of deep spiritual conviction and here we find the marcato accent, an accent of nuance. Beethoven was the first great composer to use the marcato accent. We come to the end of this passage with the classical expectation of something like this. Perfectly coherent and beautiful, right? But this is Beethoven.
Here we feel the true power of Beethoven, an earth-shattering emotional upheaval of the sudden seismic change to D minor and the power of the massive chords punctuated with sforzandos. It's almost impossible not to hear this passage as symphonically conceived, scored with brass instruments reinforcing the texture. Where Haydn might surprise us and Mozart might delight us, Beethoven jolts and shocks us to defy all expectation and convention. Now, the magnificent closing and coda. Here and throughout Beethoven's piano music, the coda often becomes a very special point of repose and reflection a summation or conclusion. There is nothing in this piece that, technically speaking, is beyond the capability of a talented and dedicated intermediate or early advanced pianist. There is no rhythmic complexity or polyrhythm as we find in many classical sonatas. But finding the Beethoven persona here in these magnificent slow movements was something Franz Liszt would pose as a challenge even to the world-class pianists who studied with him to see if they were true artists, musicians, and Beethoven interpreters rather than mere virtuosos. In fact, Liszt, the greatest and most important Beethoven player of the 19th century, would sometimes play the slow movements for the master class. One day, Emil Zauer played the first movement of the Opus 106 Hammerklavier and the 72-year-old Liszt, who had not played a formal public recital in a quarter century, said, I will play the scherzo and the adagio sostenuto for you. I quote Carl Lachman, an American pianist who went to study with Liszt a few years before Liszt's death. The instant Liszt seated himself at the piano, age was forgotten. He seemed transformed, rejuvenated, when he came to the adagio, he dearly loved these slow movements of Beethoven. His eyelids drooped a bit, and his breathing became perceptibly heavier. We all stood spellbound, motionless, hardly daring to breathe lest the charm be broken. His words, uttered shortly before of Beethoven's A major symphony adagio, now came to mind expressive of his own playing. How this music, hovers in the air as if it was not of the earth. When Liszt played, there was no thought of the technical, the material, or apparently of time. It was all spirit, a fervent expression of the soul. The fervent expression of the soul, more profound words for creating the persona and the power of Beethoven in our playing cannot be imagined. 